We're wrapping up our series today, uh, Victory and Surrender. It's been a month. We've been looking at various aspects about surrender. In week one, again, in each one of these, we look to Jesus as our model. Week one, the thrust of was really simply put, we are called to surrender to Jesus and to surrender like Jesus. And that when we do, there's victory in surrender because of who we're surrendering to. Uh, week two, Paige brought a fantastic message within the context on Mother's Day of parenting and parenthood, but the greater application was there for everyone about surrendering things like control, identity, our authenticity, so that he has the full reign in those areas. And then last week, man, if you missed Pastor Hugo's message last week, I was in North Carolina for a wedding for my nephew, but I watched the whole service online that was an incredible message on uh, surrendering to suffering. And if you missed last week's message, I, I just cannot encourage you strongly enough to go back and watch that message. It was so good and so powerful. In fact, we sort of say it around the office here that we're adjusting his title, he, uh, name and title. He is now Pastor Hugo in Fuego Reyes. Like, because... Man, when that dude preaches, it is flat out fire. So when you see him next, just say, hey, Pastor in Fuego, glad to see you. But praise God for that. And then today what we're going to do, I'm going to wrap us up by looking at surrendering to the Spirit. Surrendering to the Spirit. And again, we're going to turn our attention and our affection to Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate model of what it means, what it looks like, um, what the implications are to live a life in our humanity surrendered to the spirit. Um, and so let me, let me just begin here. Uh, ever since August the 15th, 1992, 2 p.m., Jacksonville, Florida, Murray Hill Baptist Church, when Lillian and I said, I do, ever since that moment, she and I have done life together every single day. Like we're a team, we're united. We're not perfect. Our marriage isn't perfect. Um, our, our kids aren't perfect. So we're all in good company. But I can stand before you and say, we certainly have done life together, united together as one. Our lives have literally been entwined in every way. And they've grown over the course of 30 years. August will celebrate 31 years of marriage. From the smallest and seemingly unimportant things to the biggest, deepest, and hardest things, Together, we rely on, depend on, and walk in an intimate relationship with each other moment by moment. Now, think about this. By knowing our relationship, you should rightly assume that she is involved in all of my life, as she should be if we're one, and likewise, me to her. Whether I directly state the fact or not, in other words, Every time we meet and talk and I'm telling you things or speaking of things that are going on in my life, I don't have to include Lillian. In fact, think about it. If I did that every single time, you might get annoyed with me and eventually say, space. It's just implied. It's assumed because of our relationship and because of the intimacy of our relationship. And I say all that to say, Jesus and the Holy Spirit as he walked this earth in human form, had that type of a relationship. So every time Jesus says or does something, the scripture doesn't need to say, empowered by the spirit, Jesus said, in and through the power of the spirit, Jesus did. Now it does say that. And I'm gonna show you that the totality of in human form, Jesus's existence is intricately entwined with the Holy Spirit. But the scriptures don't have to say that because it is understood that they're walking in that relationship. And the reason why from, the, from his human side is that Jesus surrendered to the Spirit and therefore the Spirit empowered everything that Jesus did. He surrendered to the Spirit and the Spirit empowered in his human form, everything that Jesus did. Former Wheaton College professor Gerald Hawthorne has written on this subject of Jesus' relationship with the Holy Spirit. Here's just a short quote. He would say this, quote, not only is Jesus our Savior because of who he was and because of his own complete obedience to the Father's will, but 
He is the supreme example for us of what is possible in a human life because of one's total dependence upon the Spirit of God. And I often wonder how much, as we look and read through the Gospels and see the life of Jesus, and we attribute automatically to his divinity that he was God, as opposed to realizing that's his humanity empowered by the Holy Spirit. In fact, scripture would teach us while he was fully divine, 100% God, 100% human, he clothed or veiled by and large that divinity and walked in his humanity to be like one of us, to experience the things that we've experienced and to show and reflect and demonstrate what the full empowerment of the Holy Spirit can look like in human form. So we turn our hearts and attentions to Jesus and see that he matured by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as his followers, we mature spiritually in the same way through and with and in the power of the Holy Spirit, never void of it. In fact, let me make it a statement a different way. The only way for Christ followers to become like Jesus is by the power of the same Holy Spirit who empowered Christ. We simply, I, I simply, apart from the Holy Spirit, cannot become more like Jesus. That's why Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit of many names, but one of the main things he referred to him as the helper. And why did he, why did he call the Holy Spirit the helper? Because we, need, we needed help. Turn to somebody and say with love, you need help. And now say to yourself, I need help. He's the helper. A apart from him, we simply can't. But with him, in him, through him, he does amazing things. So let me say it like this. The Holy Spirit helped Jesus, and he wants to help you too. He wants to help me. So let me just quickly, I just want to give you a snapshot. Someday we're going to come back to this, and we'll take probably a whole two-month series and look at Jesus, the Spirit-filled man. Because every one of these I'm going to give you could be standalones to dig into. But I, I want you to see that that f the totality of his human existence in Jesus from his conception, life, all of this was intertwined with and literally evidence of his surrendering to the spirit, all right? Note takers, I'm gonna give this to you really fast, but number one from scripture, we see that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.20, Luke 1.35. Literally at his conception, human form, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now think about that for just a second. This was a bit overwhelming to me. Think about the humility and the surrender of the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, to allow himself and his humanity to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Obviously, we understand so that he wouldn't receive the taint of original sin. He had to be like us in every way possible, but he also had to be unlike us so that perfect could die for imperfect, sinless for sinful. But his conception was through and by and with the Holy Spirit from the beginning evidence of his surrender to the Spirit's working and to the Father's will. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit was present at Jesus' baptism. All four Gospels, in some way, shape, or form, speak to his, his baptism. The Bible tells us, and we'll look at this in more detail here in a second, that Jesus was filled with the Spirit. Luke 4.1. Jesus was filled with the Spirit. We're also told that he was led by the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit, he was led by the Spirit. Acts 10 shows us that he was anointed by the Spirit. The very word the Christ means the anointed one. Luke 4 also tells us that Jesus was full of power through the Spirit. Luke 10, I love this one. I love all of them, by the way. Luke 10 says, he was full of joy through the Spirit. Full of joy through the Spirit. Hebrews 9, 14 reveals to us that Jesus was led to sacrifice himself by the Spirit. 
So even as he makes the path that walks the path to his death, his obedience certainly is to the Father and the Father's will, but is also surrendered to the leading of the Spirit. And it was the Spirit who was in his humanity leading him to the cross. And he was surrendered to that leading. He was also, according to Romans 8, and I would say Ephesians 1, verses 18 to 20, he was resurrected by the Spirit. And then ultimately, 1 Peter 3, 18, he was made alive by the Spirit. So I just, I'm just trying to paint a quick picture so that you can see from beginning to his resurrection, even to his ascension, when Jesus is like, hey, it's better for you that I leave. And why, why did he say it was better for you that I leave? So that he could send who? The Holy Spirit. So every aspect of his life was intertwined and empowered by the work of the Spirit in him as he was surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So let's just look for a couple of minutes. We have a couple of baptisms today uh, here at the end of the service. But let's, let's look at a couple of verses. And I want us to see three, just three things to give us a platform by which to think, process, pray into, contemplate, and maybe even apply to our lives in regards to this surrendering to the Spirit. All right, look at Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Uh, let me read this first. The Bible tells us he's come off of his baptism God has spoke, the Trinity showed up at his baptism, the Son of God in human form, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and God the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, this is my Son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased, right? So now, before he begins his public ministry, look at what Luke tells us. Jesus, number one, full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. By the way, with what I just shared with you, I don't believe that Jesus got filled with the Spirit at his baptism. He was filled with the Spirit at his conception. But this was just a physical evidence so that people could realize this is the anointed one. That's a whole other message. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Look what he does. He left the Jordan and, number two, was led by the Spirit. So Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. And as he was full or filled with the Holy Spirit, he was then led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And again, I know the scripture's not trying to make this almost seem a bit funny, but to me it is because for 40 days he ate nothing, and then the scripture says at the end of them he was hungry. <laughs> yes. I don't know what to say. <laughs> like, yes? <laughs> at the end of four hours I'm hungry, and so at 40 days, maybe an understatement. Maybe there's somewhere in the Greek that's really emphatic. I don't know. Now, so, so he's filled with the Spirit, and, and all three of these, I believe, are intricately linked together, and they flow in and out of each other, right? He was filled with the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was led into the wilderness. We'll talk about this in a second. He's tempted. He's tested. He resists Satan in and through the power of the Spirit, even though he's physically exhausted and depleted. And now as he returns, look at what the Scripture says. Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the, what? Power of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. All of those are linked together. I'll propose to you this, and I believe Scripture backs this up. We don't walk in the power of the Holy Spirit if we aren't filled with the Spirit. If we aren't filled with the Spirit, we'll be led, but we will be prone not to be led by the Spirit. But when we're filled with the Spirit, like Jesus, we're led by the Spirit and we're empowered and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me just, let me just unpack all three of those real quick, just for understanding and, and application. What is this being full of the Holy Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. We are literally, through Scripture, commanded to be filled with the Spirit. That's Ephesians chapter 5, I believe, verse 18. And, and the wording of that verse is written like this. Continually be being filled with the Spirit. 
So l- let me explain what I believe, and you could disagree, and that's, that's fine. We can have the conversation. I believe scripture teaches that at the moment of our salvation, at the moment our spiritual eyes are open to actually see Jesus for who he is and for what he's done, and the moment we, we, we profess and confess and accept his gift of eternal life, I believe scripture teaches we are given the Holy Spirit. See Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. It states it very plainly. Other passages too, but that's probably the clearest one to me. And again, at that moment, I believe Scripture teaches we received all of the Holy Spirit. Not a part of him, and then over the coming days and weeks and months, we somehow get more of the Holy Spirit, and we're on a quest to get more of the Holy Spirit. Here's the simplest and most profound reason I think we need all the Holy Spirit, the moment of salvation, because the moment we confess to follow Jesus, we need every ounce of the power of the Holy Spirit to actually follow Jesus. I don't need a third of him. I don't need a half. I need all. And so I get all the Holy So then what is this being filled with the Spirit and be being filled? Let me put it like this, and we've taught this here regularly at Pinal Church. I don't believe Scripture teaches that to be filled with the Spirit means that we get more of the Spirit. It means that the Spirit gets more of us. As we surrender, listen, in the context, right, victory and surrender. As we surrender to the Spirit, we are filled with the Spirit. As I, my jury, begin to take back areas and hang on to things and, and hold on to things or take back ground that he wants to do amazing things with, I still have all of the spirit, but he's not filling every part of me. And then I will begin to operate in portions of my flesh as opposed to the empowerment of the spirit. I don't know. Experience has taught me the more I operate in the flesh, the more I'm probably going to jack things up. But the more I surrender and the more I walk in the Spirit, buckle up and hang on. That is an amazing ride. And unbelievable things happen. And I think the call to us, like Jesus, is to be filled with the Spirit. And that simply means surrendering. Like, what is it? It's surrendering control to the Spirit. I don't know how else to try and put the bread on the shelf where we can all take a bite. Literally surrendering to the Spirit. And the more we're surrendered, the more we're filled. The less we surrender, the less we're filled. But this is an on, at least it's an ongoing surrender. Because I find that I surrender and then I keep walking and then eventually I begin to just like hang on to stuff or um, Doubt creeps into my mind, and I start entertaining doubt and hanging on to doubt. Um, uh, um, Addictions present themselves to me, and they appeal to the weakness in my flesh, and I might be prone to move strongholds. I get hurt by somebody. I get hurt deeply by somebody. The wound is real. The pain is real. The rejection is real, and my flesh wants to hang on to that and harbor that and cling to that. Um, And the Spirit says, no, I want you to surrender that to me and relinquish control. You're still going to feel the feels, but I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to care. I'm going to heal. You either make me Lord of your hurt or your hurt will be Lord of you. You know, that type of a thing right there. Like like all of these things. So it's an ongoing surrender because we're still fallen, broken people and we live in a fallen, broken world. You understand what I'm saying? So like, like be being filled. It's an ongoing, regular surrender to the Holy Spirit. But as we do, like Jesus, then we will find ourselves more and more being led by the Spirit led by the Spirit in places to go, led by the Spirit in conversations to have. Hey, listen, led by the Spirit to say no, or led by the Spirit, even though we want to, to have to speak into something, or to, he will oftentimes, I would just refer to it as a bridle. You ever been bridled by the Holy Spirit? I'm not a horse rider, as you can tell. That is. But my understanding is, when you want to make a horse go, you don't pull back on the bridle. You, you still hang on to it, but you kick it in the sides and get it moving. When you want to stop the horse, you bridle the horse, right? You pull back. And, and if you're really cool, you say, whoa. <laughs> the, sometimes when we're led by the Spirit, and I know some of you experience this. Like, man, you want to go there or you want to say that. Or maybe sometimes as parents when things are getting wonky with our kids and I want to speak into something and his Spirit says, whoa. 
Easy, easy, bro. Not, not right now. Don't. Don't. I'll release you when it's time. Right now is not time. I remember having, I've had conversations with people in the church, and like, there, there's there's a job opportunity. There's one individual I'm thinking, of, and like, it it was a promotion. It looked good. It was more money. Like on the surface, in the flesh, human, like go for that, make that happen. And the more he pressed into it, the more he walked with the spirit, the spirit said, whoa, whoa. And as that opportunity passed in, as only the spirit does sometimes, not all, but a whole different thing opened up and it was much more in his wheelhouse. And he is loving what he's doing. I just, church, we're led by the spirit. Jesus was directed to places like we are. He was directed to various people. You ever consider the fact, again, remember what I said at the beginning, the Bible doesn't have to say, by the Spirit, Jesus did, or by the Spirit, Jesus didn't. But let's just think forth, and those of you familiar with the passage in the story in John 11 of Lazarus. How do you think Jesus knew Lazarus was sick, but don't go to him right now, stay put? It was the Holy Spirit. He just bridled Jesus. We're not going right now. And Jesus said the whole reason we're not going, the spirit had empowered and revealed to him because on the back end of this thing, there's gonna be a greater miracle done and God's gonna get more glory. Now, we don't, we don't always get the revelation of that, do we? We don't always get the, sometimes why he says no or why he says go. Ooh, there you go. Sometimes he says no, sometimes he says go. I believe that was Jesus being led by the Spirit. Isn't it interesting? Can I just say something here? This, as this passage, the Holy Spirit may lead us to some less than desirable places. Or maybe we could say the Holy Spirit may lead us into some less than desirable seasons in our life. In this case, the Spirit led Jesus into a wilderness. Read up and just search the wilderness that Jesus, like this place, according to like, as I've read, just an awful place. I've been in the supposed place in Israel where they believe he was tempted. It is a barren wilderness, for sure. And it's fascinating that the spirit led him there. Now, why would Jesus go to the wilderness? Because he was surrendered to the spirit. And in his surrender, the Spirit led him to a less than desirable place, but he trusted the leading of the Spirit and he followed the Spirit into that place. And isn't it interesting that in that place where Jesus fasted for 40 days, that Satan shows up in a less than desirable place. But it's always fascinating to me. I don't know if you've ever considered this, right? Jesus was filled with the Spirit and Jesus was led by the Spirit and Satan came right at him and tempted him. Now, he was physically weak and exhausted, but he was filled with the Spirit. I think sometimes we think the greatest temptations happen only when we're at our lowest ebb and only when we're struggling spiritually. We can be riding high on a mountain, totally filled with the Spirit, and you can expect Satan to tempt in some way, shape, or form. And through the leading of the Spirit, Jesus even defended against those temptations by using the sword the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hmm. So sometimes the Holy Spirit will lead us to a hard place. Can I give you a quote that just has been so meaningful to me? And I hope it ministers maybe to some of you in the room. Listen to this. Being in a hard place with God is better than being in an easy place without him. Man, has that ministered to my heart. Because let's just be honest, we don't say, gosh, the hard place is awesome. Everybody join me. This is so beautiful. But at the same token, when we're following the leading of the Spirit, when he leads us into hard places, it is for a purpose. It is for a reason. There is something that he is working to accomplish. There's a will of the Father that is being played out either in you or in someone else's life. And the only way that's accomplished in my life or someone else's is by walking into that hard place or walking through that wilderness. We have to trust the leading of the Spirit. And the less filled I am, the less I'm going to trust him to go there. And the more my flesh is going to say, I don't want to go to the wilderness. I don't want to step in there. But the more I relinquish control and surrender to him, when, 
So where he leads me, I will, isn't there an old chorus? Where he leads me, I will follow. Hmm. Romans 8, 14 says, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. Following the spirit is a mark of being a daughter and a son of God. So as we're filled with the spirit and we're led by the spirit, ultimately like Jesus, we will operate in the power of the spirit. Can I, this is my opinion. I think when we talk about the power of the spirit, we create a very small lane. And I'll say, even in regards to Jesus, I think when we talk about the power of the spirit in Jesus, we create a very small lane and we focus on a few things. Uh, Jesus raised the dead. Jesus did healings everywhere he went. Jesus cast out demons. There's the power of the spirit. And we shrink the lane. And I just think the lane is a lot wider and for many of us, a lot, a lot more applicable in our day-to-day -day living. I'm not saying God doesn't do miracles. I'm not saying he still doesn't heal. We've seen it in this church. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I believe the power of the Holy Spirit is found in what we believe to be or perceive to be some of the most simplest things. But it's actually evidence of the power of the Spirit. Do you realize that Jesus said he, he's, he will illuminate the words. Like when we read scripture and scripture comes to life and makes sense, like that's the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. When you and I learn a spiritual lesson through the word, through others, through life experience, and we gain a lesson and we're taught in those moments, do you realize that's the power of the Spirit in my life? He's a teacher. He's the teacher. Like th th these are incredible things. Have you ever considered, can I just throw this one out there to you? Like, just wrestle with this this week. One of the works that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do, I think is evidence of his power in our lives, is Jesus said he'll convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Like the Holy Spirit is a convictor, or the word simply means to convince, to convince, right? I believe the convincing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is incredible evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit to convince us of the truth, to convince or convict us when we begin to stray from the truth, when we begin to adopt philosophies or thinking of the world that are contrary to the truth, when we are, when we are being subtly turned away from the truth, things that would pull the attention, the affections of our heart. Like That's a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you a question? Like, don't answer out loud. Like, when's the last time you've experienced the convicting or the convincing work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Now, if you're like, um, I, I can't remember the last time, then one of two things, pro maybe, maybe, like, you're like almost there like Jesus. <laughs> or, or maybe we've become accustomed to tuning him out Maybe it's areas that I've not surrendered to the Spirit. Because I know this. He's constantly at work in my heart. He's, he's doing a work, and his work is multifold, right? But one of those works is to convict. And listen, conviction is not a bad thing. Why are we like, we always get the picture like somehow conviction is a bad thing. You know, you get the person white knuckling it at church. You get a message, and the Holy Spirit's talking to your heart, and then, the invitation comes and you're grabbing a hold of the chair in front of you because I am not going to go forward to pray with somebody. I'm not going to make a decision. Get me out of this place. I, the convicting work of the Spirit is so sweet. Do you realize it's actually healing? Like it's, maybe we could just say what he's trying to do in convicting us is to heal us. And it happens a lot of different ways. But do you know sometimes, sometimes we have to like get stuff sort of cut out of our heart? A little spiritual surgery? Get stuff cut out of our heart and like let, let, let the spiritual surgeon do an incredible work for us. And what's, what's the reason? Like, what, what, why does he want to do that? To heal us. So like last summer, I came off a bad sunburn and I looked in the mirror and I've told somebody, I like, looked in the mirror and there was a red dot on my nose. I'm like, that's cancer because I've had it before, skin cancer. I knew it. I knew it as soon as it showed up. When I tried to rub it off and it wouldn't rub off, I said, that's cancer. I just know what it looks like. I told Lillian, I got skin cancer. So I quickly called my dermatologist. They got me in pretty quick. I said, mm, 
She took a look at it. She goes, I think you have skin cancer. I said, I know. I told you that. <laughs> By the way, my initials are MD, so could we be on the same page? I'm joking. <laughs> Doctors, please don't throw stuff or send me emails later. I'm joking. No, I, praise God, they got me in quick. And she's like, we need to get that out. I'm like, yes, we do. So here's what I did. Listen, I want you to begin, like, you know what I did? I surrendered myself in trust to the surgeon to get something out of me that was very harmful to me. Listen, listen, listen. This is for somebody. I just get it. Like, the longer I let that thing linger, the more damage it does. And the harder it is to get out. Have you ever looked at your nose? There's not a lot of skin there. I'm like, am I going to have to have a nose job? Like, what are they going to do? Reconstruction? Luckily, they got a newer procedure and it works a lot better. Praise God. Praise God for doctors, nurses. You women and men are awesome. But I'll tell you what. So you say, well, well I, did the surgery hurt? Well, yes and no. They gave me a lot of shot. My nose swelled up. I didn't feel a thing other than some yanking when they were, like, I didn't feel a thing. But afterwards, when the pain, that hurt. It hurt. But guess what? Eventually, that pain went away. My scar is healing. And I'll tell you what, I am thankful I surrendered to the surgeon. Dr. B was his name. He was super cool. Spiritually, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows, he knows some things that need to be cut out. And I think, I think that is every bit as powerful as some of the other aspects of the Holy Spirit. But we have to surrender to it. Here's a final thing, and then we're going to take communion and baptize. It's one final thing I think is like the, the evidence of the power of the Spirit in Jesus. I don't know if you ever sort of attached these two together. But Jesus loved fiercely. I believe it was through the power of the Spirit. When we say the fruit of the Spirit, what's the first word that comes up from Galatians 5.22? You know what the first word is of these ninefold fruit? Love. I think that's intentional. Jesus being filled with the Spirit, evidence. That'd be a great study for some of you Bible buffs. Go through the Gospels and try and find each one of the fruit of the Spirit in the actions and the words and the ways that Jesus evidenced the fruit of the Spirit in his life. Jesus loved people fiercely. Jesus loved people that hated him. Jesus loved people that just struggled to follow him. Jesus loved people that rejected him. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do from the cross. Is there not a greater statement of love? For he did all of that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think when we are led by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, listen to this, we, through the power of the Spirit, have the capacity to truly love people like Jesus. In fact, I mean, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest of all these laws? Some, whatever, four to 600, depending on who added what. And he said, I'll sum it up in one for you. It's all about love, love God. And then he said, by the way, I'll throw in an extra. The second greatest command is what? Love people. We do not have the capacity to love like Jesus apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we are filled and led by the Spirit, he will lead us to love people, even people that hate us, even people that disagree with us, even, even people that think of Christians in such a way that society casts us in a picture. We're called to love people, and the Spirit empowers us. Can we be honest? Sometimes it's hard, hard to love those closest to us. Uh, I, this, this thing's been on my brain for the week, and I was scrolling through Instagram. Look at this. A child wrote this. I thought this was fantastic. Guys, pull that up in the back. Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> we can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit, but listen, in and with and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we, can, we truly can literally love our enemies. And if the Holy Spirit led us to lay down our lives for them, that's the, that's the power of love. 
That's the, that's the power. Romans 5, 5 tells us that God poured his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We carry the fullness, the essence of God's love within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So right now, as we prepare, prepare for communion, what a great evidence of Jesus surrendering and the love of God. Um, if you didn't get your element, I want to invite you to raise your hand and hold that up so we can make sure to serve you. As we're doing that, I just got felt, I don't know, I just felt prompted by the Spirit. Can I lob something? I feel like this is, some, maybe you're, maybe it's somebody in the room or maybe it's somebody online. When we talk about love and the capacity to love people, um, just get a sense. Can I just speak directly to it that there's person, some people, and there's someone they're close to you. I'm not talking about someone far away or a coworker at the end of the hall. Someone close that, that used to be in your circle and and there was a closeness of a relationship, but some things have happened and and you have ceased to love them and it's actually been replaced with a bitterness towards them. Can I, can I just say to you, God sees you. God knows it, right? And I believe the Holy Spirit if you would follow him, would want to lead you to let the great gardener dig out a root of bitterness and instead actually replace that with the love of God for them. And that you would actually see and find yourself choosing to love them as opposed to hanging on to the bitterness against them. I, I, just, I just ask you to wrestle with that if that happens to be you. Just... If the Holy Spirit is God's love poured into our hearts, then not only, but one of the primary things he wants to birth in us is his fruit of love. Loving God first, because we love out of overflow. Please don't ever forget, we love out of overflow. The Holy Spirit fills us with God's love and then gives us the capacity to love others. Even people that have hurt us, even people that have rejected us, even people that we've hung on to roots of bitterness against our lives. I'm gonna tell you something, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a powerful thing. But we have to surrender to that. We have to surrender to the Spirit. And when we do, man, He will lead us in ways we could maybe never even envision and also in ways that are just small, beautiful, and powerful steps. So let's just, before we take the communion, let, let's just do this. Can you just wrestle with this for a minute or two? Is there an area or something that the Holy Spirit is asking you to surrender to him today? Before we, before we take this incredible picture of surrender, that we would open up ourselves to that. You say, PM, again, what, is, what exactly is surrender? It's simply giving up control. The Holy Spirit may change things instantaneously and there may be a full process you have to walk through. Let's be realistic. But this is a posture of the head and the heart to say, I'm surrendering and I'm giving up control of it and I'm letting it go to you, Holy Spirit. Because I want to be led by you. I want to be filled by you. And I want your power to reign in my life. So let's just pause for a moment before we take communion together and then celebrate with brothers and sisters that are going to be baptized. Spirit, we thank you. We thank you that you are at work in our lives. Can we just can we just all agree, Holy Spirit, say together, like, thank you for your patience with us. <laughs> thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that you're just constantly working. Even when we take back areas or allow things of this world to get in and to steal back things that are rightfully yours. Thank you for not giving up on us. 
Thank you for constantly doing the work to make us just a little bit more like Jesus every day. I pray for all of us, myself included, my brothers and sisters in the room online, that if there's an area or areas of our life that you're calling us to surrender, that we would trust you and we would relinquish control and give it over to you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that if there's someone perhaps in here online that needs to surrender their entire lives to you and receive you as their Savior, that there would be freedom and boldness for them to do that today in this place. And we thank you for these two that are going public with their faith, saying that they've surrendered their lives to you and they're now uniting with you. And Jesus, just continue to make us a church that every week just makes us a little bit more like you bit more like you. Thank you for your goodness to us in this place. We surrender ourselves to you fresh and anew. I pray these things over us in Jesus' name. Amen.